Chittasya Padena Vacham Malam Sharirasya Chavaitya Kena Yopakarotam Pravaram Muninam Patanjalim Pranjali Ranatosmi I prostrate with folded hands before Patanjali, who benefited mankind by delivering yoga for mind, grammar for speech, and by removing impurities of body through medicine. So in the last class, we were discussing the 17th Sutra of the very first chapter which deals with the various types of sampragyata samadhi. The word sampragyata means samyak prakrishta jnana is sampragyana. So any knowledge, the means of any knowledge is concentration. But again that concentration should be through the proper means. It shouldn't be misguided. If the concentration is adopted through the proper means, it can lead to all types of knowledge. So we will find that's the Catholicity of the Yoga Sutra. It has included, as it is dealing with the subject of concentration, it has not excluded the secular concentration. It has included that also, just to show that the with the concentration, that's the only means through which all the knowledge is gathered. There's a very famous quotation of Swami Vivekananda that if I again have to go through the process of education, instead of trying to gather the facts, I would first try to develop the faculty of concentration. Because that's the thing which is the means for all the knowledge. So if I can develop the faculty of concentration, now there's all the information that automatically, what is I try to get the information that all is internalized very easily, very effectively. So that's why he's saying that I would rather adopt to the concent, this first try to concentrate. So. That's the thing which uh, we found in that sutra. So when it is for the external things, for the perceptual knowledge, it was, it resulted in the vitarka. We are not going into the details we have already studied. The vichara is on some conceptual knowledge, which can be some external concepts. And again, it can be on the mind itself. That's the karana, the mind, the means of knowledge. When with the mind you concentrate on the mind, that gradually leads to the spiritual evolution. You stop the vagaries when you are able to stop the vagaries of the mind. Again, the Catholicity of the yoga you will find, it is not speaking of any definite type of meditation. That you can adopt any means. It may be mindfulness, it may be focus, and if it's focus, it can be focus on anything. It can be focus on the breath. It can be focus on some, uh, your ishta, on some, your chosen ideal. It can be, you will find later it will be discussed. Even if you think that I don't like to uh, focus, concentrate on any particular deity. Okay, well, you can focus, you can concentrate on some beautiful scenery some beautiful flower, whatever. There's a open, there's Yoga Sutra is open to that. You can focus on anything or you may focus on the breath itself. Uh, just, it's a bit out of context, but in one of the Upanishads, uh, Chandogya Upanishad, in the form of allegory, very nicely they describe that when you try, when you try to control the mind by having uh, some visual object, you will find some asura, some evil, some force 
will come and try to engulf your object of meditation with some bad visualization. So some good visualization you will find can be easily overturned by some bad visualization. It happens. Some good thought in the form of some mantra can easily be overpowered by some noise of all the things which you are thinking. Yeah, our thought has two, you will find our thought has two components. Any thought, one is the visualization and another is the walk, the word, the speech. Even internally when I'm thinking, the speech and the visualization, this constitutes my thought. So when I'm trying to focus my mind, the generally in our tradition, they say try to visualize the image and at the same time repeat the mantra. What's the science behind it? As our thought has two components, that whenever I'm thinking, you will find, if you just try to find out the nature of your thought, you're visualizing something. You are visualizing something and some conversation is going on for any thought. So now uh, many may say that why not just the, do the japam? Why try to visualize? Because we will find that when you are trying to visualize and at the same time try to repeat the mantra, the mind gets trained very easily. It's very easy to just go on repeating without the visualization. So that's why they say at, at least at the beginning you start with that. Both the visualization and the repetition should go hand in hand. Why? After some time, when you find that it is becoming too strenuous, now you can stop the visualization, you can go on repeating. Why this type of specific instructions are given? It has a science behind it, the psychology behind it, that thought has two components, the visualization and the conversation. This too goes on even within, even when I'm not conversing with others, within when I'm thinking, the conversation and the visualization goes hand in hand. Now, when, if I just go on, it will, you will find it happens. Sometimes I am repeating the mantra. I have just uh, selected some syllable which the guru has given me, or if I'm not initiated, I myself have selected, and I just go on repeating it. You will find what happens. The, though you are repeating the mantra, as you are not taking care of the visualization factor, it, the mind goes on visualizing so many things. Why? Because the thought has these two components. You have not taken care of the visualization. So that's why you will find that many will be criticizing that why we have so many deities. It's good one way. That it's very difficult at, very at the beginning to go to that idea of the divinity without any visualization. You will find the mind gets very easily distracted get hold of some form. Now that way you are restricting your visualization factor. And then that form is represented by some mantra. Go on repeating that. Now your focus becomes very effective. Very effective. Whatever form is up to your choice, take it. You have taken care of both the factors. Now you will find the mind is very easily getting focused. After some time when you feel the strain of it, now you leave the visualization factor. You will find that though you are not consciously trying to visualize as you have tried it for some time, the visualization goes on automatically. Now you go on only with the repetition. You can still continue with this process for a longer period and you will find that the focus is very effective. So why we are saying that it's coming in the process that how to keep the mind focused. And Yoga Sutra is open about it. So these are the way I am concentrating on the mind. How? Just trying to restrict the mind from all other vagaries. The more I get habituated, then what happens as we studied in the last class, that in the 46th Sutra, just to study the 17th Sutra, we, 17th and the 18th Sutra, we have actually uh, even resorted to the Sutra number 42 to 51. I will come to the share, screen sharing, but just before that, as we have already studied, let us remember that word, recollect. In the 46th Sutra, there was the word called Vaisharadya. That when you become adept in that type of meditation, by your habit, you have been able 
to keep your mind focused in your thought effortlessly then that vaisharadya comes what is the vaisharadya means it is a state of vishuddha sattva pure sattva what actually means your meditation is bereft of rajas and tamas now these terms confuses us but we all know rajas means activity tamas means inertia so to be bereft in meditation to be bereft to be to avoid this uh, rajas activity as well as inertia what it means that i will find that when i'm trying to meditate either the mind becomes very restless as i am not habituated to it it becomes very active that is the rajas or if i have somehow concentrated the mind for the first time the mind gets the real taste of rest and immediately it goes to the slumber tamas i have to avoid both for that the practice is required through practice i can avoid that extreme activity as well as i can avoid the mind to going to that slumberness it remains alert but without any thoughts or at least just one thought bereft of all thoughts then what happens this adhyatma prasada this the vaisharadya leads to adhyatma in the 46 sutra it is a tremendous joy where even the body has as if fallen off when your mind gets tremendously focused the real joy that comes has no end in our day to day life all other sensual pleasures have a limitation the delicacy which i like most the first serving i enjoy the second serving okay by the time you are being served the third serving is there you yourself will say no you are satiated you cannot continue with it but there is a joy is a different type of joy when you enter into a flow what has happened your mind is so focused in your object of meditation the all other objects falls off you will find when your mind is focused gradually all other distractions falls off and if you become still more concentrated even the bodily feeling starts falling off your hunger thirst tiredness you don't feel your mind is so focused all those bodily alarms in the form of hunger thirst tiredness the need to sleep the mind doesn't have the capacity to take care of all those distractions there are also distractions those bodily alarms they fall off for the time being and you enter into that wonderful flow and that gives you a sense of videha as though you are in the body you don't feel the body and only that wonderful uh, that bliss enunciates the bliss is emanating you are not you are not even aware of your body the gradually the feeling of the body goes off the state of videha which is very nicely can be understood in uh, one of the uh, uh, was one of the sto- small story uh, there there are so many uh, stories in that uh, the book uh, what's the fact i'm immediately forgetting very nice that uh, these adventures of our uh, that's a special character right? for this it's a book for the children ah huh? no no not in it's in english uh harry potter no not harry potter just immediately i forget it's a very old book even swami vivekananda refers to it uh it it in his lectures i i i can just tell you one minute in uh where the story of the cheshire cat is there i think uh that in wonderland alice in wonderland yeah so really i was just was in this alice in wonderland there is a wonderful that this the is the small girl alice you know that the story sometimes for us, for us as an adults to relate to those stories is sometimes we find it is as if it has nothing to do with the rational mind but you will find the children like it very much swami ji is saying very interesting thing that sometimes we cannot relate to the child's mind the child thinks it's all rational the author somehow could recollect the mind of the child and has written that book and that was some which was something very it used to be very popular among the children and there one such incident is there what's the incident is that alice whenever is 
uh, having a confrontation with a Cheshire cat, that famous cat. Now that, that cat is extremely witty. Uh, suddenly it will just put some uh, question to Alice in, a, in the form of a quiz. And before Alice could think and reply, the Cheshire cat will again, again put some question. So that makes Alice very irritated. So she says, can't you just uh, wait a little? Why you have to just always uh, be so fast in your questions? And now that in that book, you know, as it is a, the book of the children and the children have all those fantasies which they take to be fact. So the author very nicely is just describing. Now, as uh, the Cheshire cat has been asked that not to uh, that put the question again and again so quickly after asking the question and not only that he has to uh, that yeah the Cheshire cat not only will ask the question that before he will uh, that uh, Alice will reply after asking the question the cat will disappear suddenly it will disappear so that make the make Alice very very irritated that you don't give the time even to reply before that you disappear just be a bit patient don't disappear so suddenly. The Cheshire cat agrees. Okay, I won't disappear so suddenly. So now the next time when the Cheshire cat asks question and Alice is about to answer, now Alice finds a wonderful thing. The entire cat is gradually disappearing. That the legs, the limbs, the body, the ears, the face, the eyes, and at last, at last what remains is just a grim. A wonderful green from year to year, a smile. That only remains. The Alice cannot see anything apart from the green. So that's the story, wonderful story, which speaks of the state of Videha. In meditation, at last we, like the Cheshire cat, will find that everything is disappearing. What remains is that wonderful green, the bliss. That's the thing which at last remains. So that's the state of Videha. Uh, very nicely through that story, you can relate that what's a nice story that's Cheshire cat. That it, the cat gradually starts disappearing and then only the green remains. That wonderful state of bliss. That has been described as the Ananda. So Ananda is not something different from the Nirvichara. The Nirvichara, the conceptual knowledge, when the concept is not something external, you take the mind itself as the object of your meditation, as the sukshma object as a subtle object of your meditation then it leads to ananda and when you get habitual to the state of ananda then that leads to asmita now in ananda what has happened only the bliss is there everything has fallen off in our day-to-day -day life we never experience asmita what we experience is ahankara the asmita is always linked with something i I am enjoying a particular delicacy. My amness is now linked with that delicacy. Whatever I'm enjoying for that, I have to be linked with. My amness has to be linked with something. So that is ahankara. But what is the difference between ahankara and asmita? That amness bereft of its engagements, all engagements. That is the pure asmita. So in now in that state of ananda, where our mind has already experienced that let go, Everything has fallen off. You are in the pure bliss. First, you get totally absorbed with that bliss. Gradually, when it becomes habituated, you can as if separate the one who is witnessing the bliss, that pure bliss. That's the state of asmita, the amnes bereft of all its engagement. So when you go there, that state, what happens? Then the ritambhara pragya. A wonderful that wisdom which is full of truth, ritam bhara. Ritam means truth, pragya means wisdom. Wisdom which is bhara, full of truth. That ensues when you can when you get established in that amnes. Why? Because that amnes is free from all biases. As we told, now my amnes is linked with something. I like this. I am fan of this team. So what happens when the match is going on, as all the fans are sitting, if for some reason there is a fight, and after the fight, now the, even the uh, 
uh, audience gets involved in that fight. Now, if the media goes and takes the interview, you will find a wonderful thing. Both the sides are saying the other side has done the mistake. Why it is happening? Because no one can see the exact truth because their mind is already biased by their likeness. But in that state, where all the biases has fallen off, now you see the thing as it is. So your knowledge becomes bereft of all the biases. It becomes a true knowledge. In the last class, we were giving the example that how that all the prophetic visions comes to all the prophets because of being established in that state. But that is also not the last state. Or that state, we have to go beyond that state. So that's the thing which will take us to the 18th Sutra. If you can go beyond that state, where the mind itself, which at present has stopped all the distractions, it is got habituated in that pure amness. Still, the thought of that I am, I am is there. The mind is still there. Though I may be saying that I am the conscious principle. This has enabled me to stop the vagaries of the mind, my all attachments. But I should remember this itself is also a part of the mind. A mind itself is saying, I am not the mind, I am consciousness. That's the paradox. So we, through our meditation, can go beyond that where the mind stops and you get established in the real you, the conscious principle, the purusha, which you are. As long as the mind is there, I can never get identified with that. So that will lead to the asampragyata, where the so-called knowledge all falls off. You go even beyond knowledge and get established in the pure amnes. What it is is very difficult to explain. We will come to the discussion today. In all the mystical experience, in all the religion, we will find two things. When you go to that state, uh, it has been described as something noetic. Noetic means you are fully convinced that you have realized the truth. Noetic. In the, you, the Khandana, the Aratrikam song which we sing every day, there is phrase comes. Gata Shangshaya Drira Nishchaya. Or Gata Shangshaya, all the doubts has fallen off. Drira Nishchaya. I am fully convinced. No one can waver my conviction. No one can just uh, take away my conviction. Fully convinced. If I have seen, some, if from childhood in the textbook I have read about ocean, I have not seen it. Ramakrishna in the gospel is saying, Someone may come and explain me that there is nothing called ocean. What is written in the book is nonsense. And I may believe him. But once I have seen the ocean, that other person may go on uh, with arguments trying to convince me for hours together that there is nothing called ocean. I even won't argue with him. I will just think he's a mad fellow. Once I have seen the ocean, the argument also will fall off. Because I've seen, there's a conviction, there's no question of argument. When Narendra Nath, uh, this, the Vivekananda, the young Vivekananda, Narendra Nath, was in search of the truth, when he at last came to Ramakrishna, everywhere he, he went, nowhere he found the satisfactory answer to his question, whether God is. When he came to Ramakrishna, you will find a wonderful thing. He's not trying to argue. He's not trying to convince Narendra through all arguments that God is because this, 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 this other way the world, has, uh, what is the creation is, nothing. Just direct answer, yes, I have seen God. And not only that, I can even make you see God. And another thing is, I see God more clearly than I see you. Because that becomes a reality more convincing reality than even this world. At present for me, this world is something real, tangible. When I speak of God, it is something visualization, imagination. For me, it's not as tangible as this real world. For them, it becomes just the opposite. This world becomes something like a dream. That, be that, world, that world becomes something, that level of awareness becomes something 
which is the absolute reality. And they, nothing can, nothing can take away that conviction. And that is what's noetic. You'll find all the prophets in all the religions reaches that state. That's the commonality. There's, we may ask what is the commonality of all the religion. In whatever way you may speak, the language may be different, but you will find the prophet is the convinced soul. No one can take away that conviction. But at the same time, another thing, ineffable. If you ask him what that realization is, when someone is to ask Ramakrishna to explain his realization, he in his very unique way is to say that I'm trying my best, but the mother is choking my throat. She is not allowing me to speak. That's what in the scriptures say, avang manasa gocharam. It's something which cannot be explained. Muka aswadhanavat. Just like a dumb, deep and dumb person who has tested something but cannot explain. A small child who is yet to learn the language has tested something. You ask, with all sorts of noise, he will try his best, but he cannot explain. So that is ineffable. So they cannot, they have, they're convinced of some truth, but which cannot be explained. So this asampragyata state is something which speaks of that. So we will take up, that has been spoken of in the 18th Sutra, how this last stage of the asampragyata, the Ritambhara pragya ultimately leads to asampragyata, that we will try to just discuss today with the help of uh, from the 48th to the 51st Sutra and then we will come back to the 18th Sutra which speaks of that Asampragyata Samadhi. That's how it comes. That has been explained from the 48th to the 51st Sutra. So now I will share the screen to refer to the Sutras and go to the explanation. I think it was closed. Just one minute, I'm just sharing the screen. So in the last class, we were studying the Sutra 49, that when you reach the state of that Ritambhara Pragya, that pure asmita, unbiased uh, amnes, which leads to the true knowledge, whatever you focus, as all the biases has fallen off, the true knowledge comes, just uh, manifests. The knowledge that is gained in that state, we have studied in the 48th Sutra as Ritam Bhara Pragya. So 49th, we have already started, we have already uh, studied the 49th Sutra also in the last class. What it says, Sruta Anumana Pragyabhyam Anya Vishaya Vishesha Arthatvat. So in short, as we have already discussed what it is saying, very simply, Sruta Anumana Pragyabhyam Anya, Sruta. Till now, till you realize, you have heard many things. And after hearing, you have made a lot of inferences. Sruta, Anumana. Sruta, you have heard. Anumana means a lot of inferences. From that, the pragya which develops. This Ritambhara pragya is different from that. To explain with the help of example, suppose you have not tested the mango, but you have heard the taste of mango. So Sruta, you have heard. And after that, you have started, as you have not tested, you have started inferring. 
from the words you have heard. It is sweet and it has a nice flavor. So now you try to relate with your available fund of experience. So it is most probably it is sweet like honey. It is uh, having a flavor of jasmine. So all those are the things with my available fund of experience I'm trying to relate. So that's the inference which I'm drawing from what I have heard. So that knowledge, of course, is erroneous. The moment you go to that state of rhythm, hara pragya, pure amnes, then the pragya which comes is different from sruta and anumana. Now, however, I may try. Oh, I have understood my amnes bereft of its attachments, that pure amnes. Even in meditation, sometimes my mind is little calmed down. I think, oh, I am established in it. No. When you really go to that state, you become prophetic. That pure amnes, all the biases has fallen off. You can see the thing, anything, just as a, a, in its true uh, perspective. And all the false uh, perspectives, all the false biases, they fall off. So that when you go to that state, that knowledge is something different, like testing the mango. When you taste the mango, all the knowledge which you had from your sruta anuman, from hearing and from your inferences, they fall off. You know that they are no more true. So this knowledge is something different from sruta and anuman that we studied and vishaya, vishesha arthatvat. Now, I have a general idea of sweetness. I have general idea of flavor. When someone says mango is sweet, it has a flavor. I get a vague idea of it. But what that sweetness is, that specific vishesha, the specific sweetness, the specific flavor, only I can have, know when I taste it. So when that knowledge, realization comes of your pure amnes, from which that Ritambhara pragya ensues, then what happens? That knowledge is something which you cannot just even imagine with the help of what you have heard and from that what you have inferred. That specific knowledge is something which you have to experience. And another characteristic of Ritambhara Pragya that we will discuss today, the 50th. Tatja Sanskara Anya Sanskara Pratibandhi. The Sanskara, the latent impression that arises from Ritambhara Pragya, now what it will do? It will obstruct all other impressions. It's a very important thing. Now, we are guided by do's and don'ts. My mind is inclined to so many things. It is the do's and don'ts that stop me. I have to use my willpower. No, this is the thing I am not supposed to do. It is something which uh, will just uh, destroy my reputation. So let me try to resist from doing it. So I have to use my willpower at present. But when you reach that state of Ritambhara Pragya, then all the impressions falls off and your, this conviction becomes so strong that your goodness becomes something spontaneous. You don't have to force yourself. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Je naachte jane tar betale paaporena. The one who is an adept dancer never has false steps. It always falls in rhythm. The steps falls in rhythm automatically because she is an adept dancer. So, what actually it speaks of? It can be very this this sutra can be very nicely understood with the help of one of Swami Vivekananda's experience. Swami Vivekananda, when he was a wandering monk before going to America, as a wandering monk he was traveling through the length and breadth of India. So when he was in the western part of India, in the Rajasthan, the deserts, so when he was passing through the deserts, one day he was extremely thirsty, but he found no locality nearby, and he was in search of water. And suddenly he saw a huge reservoir, huge reservoir at a distance. And now to fetch water, he started approaching it. The more he approached, he found as if it is receding. The reservoir is receding. It's in nowhere coming near it. And at, at certain point of time, suddenly the entire reservoir disappeared. It was not there. And now it strikes Swamiji that till now, he has read it in the textbook 
of about miraj and he thought he have understood so it was shruta it was anumana he have read it he have read it in the textbook that was shruta from that he imagined that he have understood what miraj is that was the anumana but for the first time when he saw that the huge reservoir disappeared now that it becomes vishaya vishesha now he really realizes what miraj is this is very specific knowledge what the result is what is its result the next day when again he is passing through the desert again as he is in his body mind senses again the thirst he feels it's not that the thirst has vanished it's again he feels as he is in body mind senses again the mirage comes again the reservoir he sees but today there is a huge difference the sanskara which has developed from the experience the previous day that we have experienced the mirage for the first time the sanskara that has emanated from that now immediately stops all the previous sanskara previously he was drawn towards it today he knows it's a mere projection though he is thirsty though he sees the reservoir the reservoir has lost the power to drag him so now you will understand how goodness becomes spontaneous now it's a realization he has understood it's a mirage it's not real yesterday it was a reality it was dragging him today he knows it's just a mirage when you go established in the pure amness in that state where you are bereft of all the attachments then the reality starts coming in that is the mind which is playing the game i owe nothing neither the mind nor the things which i am seeing i am separate from them i owe nothing neither good nor bad in this world i am above all those things and then all these raga dvesha attachment hatred starts falling off if you know it's a projection how can you be attached to it so the sanskara which comes out of it immediately destroys all the previous sanskaras so that's the wonderful thing now you become a jivan mukta the idea that free while living that shankaracharya in vivek churamani is saying that what is the ideal of the human birth what is the uh, only goal of human birth it's not just uh, getting in engaged in all the sensual pleasures because however we may try as a human being to get totally involved in the sensual pleasures we have a limitation you will find the dog has a more intense sense of smell with all your gadgets you can never smell like a dog with all your gadgets you can never taste the food like a dog you will find with what tremendous attachment what a tremendous gusto the dog is enjoying its food at that time you disturb it gets ferocious the senses are so strong we with all our gadgets can never have those strong sensual perception like the animals as a human being that is not our goal as a human being that the special faculty is to go to this state where all our this attachment falls off why remember that this world is like the mirage it falls off now you really enjoy the happiness of freedom by transcending all those things though you're still in the world nothing touches you and that's what shankaracharya in vivek churamani is saying that jivan mukti sukha prapti hetave janma dharana the only purpose of human birth hetavya the hetu the reason for ja, this human birth janma dharana is what jivan mukti sukha prapti to attain the state of the jivan while living that that's the beauty of yoga the beauty of vedanta they don't say you have to die to go to heaven here in this life while living you can enjoy the bliss of mukti jivan mukti sukha prapti that gives a tremendous joy the joy the happiness which we are hankering it can never be found in any of the sense pleasures of life it is only in that state where the, this the sanskara which arises from that realization and which obstructs all other impressions the happiness that comes out of it is something which uh, can give you the real purpose of the human birth and that's the purpose of the human birth no other animals can do it as a human being that's the uniqueness which we have 
That's the purpose of the human birth, that we can realize that state. That's the uniqueness. If we just spend our life with the sense of pleasures, we can never do it. As we were mentioning, the animals are having that faculty much stronger. The nature has equipped them with those faculties much stronger. We, with all our gadgets, can never enjoy the world the way the animals do. Our uniqueness is there. Jivan Mukti Sukha Prapti. That happens in this stress. Tajja Sanskara Anya Sanskara Pratibandhi. But yoga, Vedanta is great. That also is a state of bliss where you're still with the mind. It's a very, very high form of enjoyment. But that's also not the highest. You are, you are bound to even renounce that. It's very difficult to understand now that what can be higher than this. It takes you beyond the idea of individuality. The next step when, some, when Swami Vivekananda was speaking of that in the West, someone from the audience shouted, Oh, Swamiji, what happens to my individuality? And Swami Vivekananda immediately replied, You are not individuals yet. It's a very nice answer. Because if you try to find out the word, the meaning of the word individu individual, it means that which cannot be divided. Individual means that which can be divided. Individual, that which cannot be divided. We in our psychophysical existence have so many parts. Our thoughts are good, bad, so many thoughts. Body has so many parts. We are constituted of so many things. Annamaya, pranamaya, this manamaya, vijnanamaya, anandamaya, koshas. That's layers after layers. This is having so many parts. When you go to the your real conscious principle, it is bereft of all parts which cannot be divided. So Swamiji very nicely is saying, you are not individual yet, because now the sense of individuality, that which we have, can be divided. I have good thoughts now, it can change to bad thoughts. I am in a good, enjoying good health, it can become bad health. These are all these various phases which can be divided, my, of my existence which can be divided, separated. That's the state, where is no duality. So that's why he's saying when you reach that state, then you become individual, not before that. Still this answer was quite philosophical for that person to understand. The next thing he told is very interesting, that you also will understand, we all will understand. He told, Madam, it's really very difficult to understand that state. You know why? Then the example he gives is wonderful. It's just like a small child busy with playing with the toys and chocolates, enjoying the chocolates and is playing with the toys and suddenly you come and say life is not that easy just playing with your toys and uh, having chocolates you have to grow you have to then, then for what so you have to become so say scientist you have to then by becoming scientist what will happen you will enjoy uh, your life by doing all those intricate research now the child really gets perplexed what joy can be there in all those research in the laboratory? It's so dry. Life is so get good with the toys and chocolates. As it is almost impossible to explain the child that what's the joy of intellectual endeavor. This child is quite happy with the toys and with the chocolate. Similarly, we in our present state who are happy with the toys of the world. At this stage, just like the child, it is almost impossible to understand the joy of that state where even the mind falls off, you get established in that real conscious life, conscious self, conscious principle, which is beyond the mind. So, but the Yoga Sutra here is trying to give us a hint of it because unless you have some idea about the ultimate reality, you will never be motivated uh, to even just try to just endeavor for it. So what it is saying in the 51st Sutra, after studying the 51st Sutra, we'll go back to the 18th Sutra because this will explain the 18th Sutra. So act actually we have studied the 17th, 18th Sutra, but we have already covered 17th, 18th and from 42nd to 51st. We are taking these sutras because the explanation lies here. So when you reach that state of that Ritambhara Pragya, where only you are established in that 
sanskara, the pragya sanskara, all thing has fallen off. Then what happens? Tasyapi nirodhe, the 51st sutra. Sarva nirodhat nirvija samadhi. Even when that pragya sanskara is also suppressed, everything is suppressed. You go bereft the mind, you go beyond the mind. The mind stops for the first time to give you the knowledge of what you really are. That the prism has fallen off. As long as the prism is there, the white light breaks into the spectrum. I take the spectrum to be the real reality. Just take off the prism. The entire spectrum vanishes. Where it has vanished, it has merged in the light. The conscious principle in association of them with the mind appears as this world of phenomenon. When you can stop it, you find that it was a mere projection. I exist as the conscious principle. And that's the thing. This the Syapi Nirodha, Sarva Nirodhat, and that takes you to the Nirvija Samadhi. These words are very interesting. Nirvija means seedless. Till here, till the 50th Sutra, as the mind is still there, the mind is like the seed, it can again sprout back. You may be in a very high state. All the things have fallen off, but the seed is still active. As Sri Ramakrishna used to give an example, a seed was lying on the terrace for years together. And one day a wind, a strong wind came and the seed was blown off. It fell on the ground and immediately it sprouted. So you may be in the state of Ritambhara Pragya. You will find in our Puranas, the Rishis established in very high state has fall. The seed is blown off again falls because the mind is still there. That somehow the pragya is gone again. You may sprout. So here they say that's why. But if the seed is boiled, if it is parched, it is roasted, it will never, it will never sprout. So this roasting of the seed is the state of nirvija, seedless. We have roasted the seed. When it happens, when even that pragya sanskara stops altogether and that takes you to that no nothing can bring you back from that state that's the real liberation now how it happens so it's something very difficult to understand but we will try we will try to with the help of the commentaries and all to understand there are so many explanations even in the advaita vedanta of shankaracharya we will resort to that to explain that state the tasyapi nirode sarva nirodhat. That what happens, the latent impressions of pragya or true knowledge attained in sampragyata samadhi destroys the latent impression of ignorance. How it happens? Let us go to the next sutra, uh, next explanation. Now, what are the latent impressions of knowledge and the latent impressions of ignorance? So, what are the latent impressions of knowledge? The causal impression, the ultimate impression behind all the impressions of <coughs> ignorance is asmita that i am this psychophysical existence that's the basic thing behind all our ignorance first you have to think yourself of body then only the question of likeness and hatred cups raga dvesha abhinivesha all those comes only when you think of yourself as psychophysical existence anything which is favorable to this i like it anything which destroys it i don't like it anything which gives it pain i don't like it so all when your amnes is linked with this psychophysical existence, then all the other all other raga, dvesha, vinivesha comes into picture. So the causal impression, the ultimate impression behind all the impressions which are the result from ignorance is this: what that I am this psychophysical existence. Now when that pragya comes from the sampragyana, then what's the knowledge comes? I am not the psychophysical existence, isn't it? that I am not this, you go into the state of videha, that I am not this, I am the pure amnes. And this impression is contradictory to that impression. As it happened, Swami Vivekananda never knew what the mirage is, till he realized. The moment he realized, immediately it, fall, it fell off. From the very next day, he, he didn't have to practice, so go through the sadhana to get rid of that. Just the moment he realizes, all that falls off. So here also that the same thing happens. All the moment you go to that realization, 
this that I am not the psychophysical existence immediately helps you to get rid of the idea of your psychophysical existence. So thus the latent impression of Sampragyana being opposed to that of ignorance first obliterates the ignorance. The ignorance is gone. <clears throat> After that what happens now this Pragya Pratyaya that I am not this body mind complex. What it happens? What it does? This that is this thought that I am not this psychophysical existence which spontaneously arises in the mind becomes the Virama Pratyaya. This word will come in the 18th Sutra. Today I am using the words terms just to explain the sutra. If I, if just we, after this explanation, if we go directly to the meaning, you will find it's very easy. Virama, the word Virama means to stop. The ultimate thought, which will see, will help in seizing the mind, cessation of the mind. Virama Pratya means, or the ultimate thought of the mind to lead to the cessation of the only impression of the mind. That is the Pragya Samskara. <coughs> to explain this, I will resort to an example. It's my own experience. What happens when the mind has really realized that you are not the mind? Now, to continue with the mind and go on contemplating that I am not the mind is a paradoxical statement. If you are not the mind, then why you are continuing with the mind? In Upanishad, they say this is called Ativada. I am speaking something which is beyond my realization. When the real realization comes in Mundaka Upanishad, they use the word Nati Vada. My words won't transcend the realization. At present, my word is transcending the realization. Why? Even in, in the state of the Dhritambhara Pragya, when I have realized I am not the mind, still I am continuing with the mind. Actually, this then in this state, when you realize that I am not the mind, ultimately this Sampragyana, this Dhritambhara Pragya, restricts even to continue with that mind. That's the last mental module which you have developed with the meditation, which has got rid of all the mental modules. Our mind is not one mind. There are various modules. All these modules are linked with asmita. Now I have created a special module with the help of meditation. This has helped to get rid of all the modules. Now it is alone linked with asmita, but this also has to fall off. How it is falls off? Automatically, because the real knowledge which is here is I am not the body mind complex. If it is not, then at last you have to leave that last module also. With the help of an example, I will try to explain that what happens. As a small child, when we used to play in our neighborhood, I still remember there was a small girl. We were also small boys, and a small and a small girl was there who used to be, who gets scared very easily. We used to make faces and she will immediately start crying and run. She was so terrified. And that was a fun for us. Every day we will make fun. Whenever we see her, we will make faces and she will just get scared and run. And one day we found when she is running back to her, uh, to her mother, she was mumbling something. And we were curious what she's mumbling. So she, she, we also ran after her and after reaching her, uh, this mother, so when she raised them, when we went to mother, we also reached and we were curious. We asked her mother that what she's mumbling. Other day she cries and runs, today she's mumbling something. Then what mother told was really something very funny. The mother told, see, she gets so scared. Yesterday when she came back uh, fr from her, uh, this uh, play and game, she returned to her uh, to house. I was explaining that whenever someone tries to scare you, assert by saying, what's there to fear? So I made her say that, just say, what's there to fear? She repeated quite a number of times. Now today, what she's doing, when you have scared her, you all have scared her, now she has already learned that what's there to scare so she is just mumbling that and she is running. So what has happened? This is Ativada. She is saying something which she has not realized. She is still scared. This word has no meaning. If she really realizes what she is saying, then she will face the, all those who are trying to scare her. She will be bold enough to face them. She won't run. So here also that Pragya Sanskara is something like that that we are saying something, we are enjoying that state, 
that I am not the body, not the mind. Why I'm enjoying? Because it has enabled me to get rid of all the baggage. I'm enjoying that lightness of that state. But that also is an attachment. Still I'm with the mind. But this Pragya Sanskara itself ultimately make me realize that. And that realization helps in getting the cessation of the mind. Just the way the girl, the moment she realizes what she's saying, she will have the faculty to face the brutes, the, all those who are uh, terrifying her. She will have that faculty here also the moment you realize and it comes in the gradual process. Then that ultimate, uh, what you say, that Paravairagya comes. There is another explanation for it, you know. When, because of the pure asmita, another thing happens. The Ritambhara Pragya helps in having the knowledge of your past births. To give an example, this is a very interesting subject. It's very interesting. Subject. At present, when, suppose you're extremely busy early in the morning, as the housewife, or maybe you are working, First, you have to cook the food for all, prepare the children for going to the school. So busy. At that time, you will find your mind is exactly focused in what you are doing. At that time, the mind cannot take care, yes, cannot think of anything else, of the past, of the future. Only when she is relaxed, all the responsibilities have been taken care of, she is now relaxing, then she will find that the mind is as if becoming more and more encompassing. So when you go establishing the Ritam Bhara Pragya, that's the thing happens. All the immediate concerts have fallen off. The mind now starts encompassing even the previous births. Why we cannot uh, recollect the previous births? Only because we are so much attached with the present concerns. That keeps the focus. You will find that even those who remember the previous birth as a small child, they, they start forgetting all those things as they start growing. As they start growing, they get more and more involved with the present. The past automatically fades away, though they were born with that. And even in the present day, there is a past life regression. Those who do, those who do it, you will find the process is something, the way they are hypnotized is what? They will be made to relax. They will be lying in the one who is about to regress to the past should be in a relaxing posture and the one who is actually helping him to regress to the past the psychologist the parapsychologist is hypnotizing to a certain extent so that he she he or she gets read uh, gets freed from all the present concerns and then the mind regresses to the past now for a realized soul means for one who has got established in that some pragyana in rhythm hara pragya all the present concerns has fallen off is as amnes has resulted in that idea that everything is a mere projection, that amnes is something that pure Asmita has enabled him to realize that. And then the mind starts encompassing in the past. You will find Buddha immediately before going to the realization, immediately became Jatismar. All the past births came to the mind. When it happens, that results in Paravairagya. Supreme detachment. You know why? Once you regress the past, you see all the lives. In the words of Swami Vivekananda, so many lives we have wasted. What we have done? Thought that earning money, having family is the goal of life. Reached that state. There was no goal. Old age came, felt dejected, as if I have been totally squeezed by life. With that state that the nature has as if befooled me, I die. And again, I repeat the same thing. I was repeating it through ages. This wasting Swamiji in one place is saying very nicely that so many lives you have wasted. Why not you give one? Why not you just waste one life for me? Means for some spiritual purpose. Means when someone he couldn't convince to bring to this type of life, so he was saying a very nice thing that we have already wasted so many lives. Why not you waste one life? You will find at last it is not a waste. It is a real thing for me. What's the idea is this idea. When you really can regress, you see that what all we were doing, life after life, the paradox of life is when we are wise enough to realize that life has given me nothing. Now I have no time. It is time to go. Again, I start anew. 
with that memory fed has faded away with again with the present concerns it is going on eternally then that para vairagya comes enough of it let this also go that results in the virama pratyaya i don't want to even continue with this last mental module let this also fall off then the virama pratyaya ensues but very interesting now you will find to keep the mind concentrated in one thought is so difficult the distractions comes and again breaks that concentration now when you reach the state of virama pratyaya the same thing happens for the first time that real let go where the mind falls off for the time being you realize your real nature but now again your mind is full of that thought that one thought i am not the body not the mind i am one with god whatever it may be that comes back it goes on this uh, ramakrishna says watch khela this to and fro goes on for some time till the virama pratyaya becomes very strong to let go of the mind once for ever leading you to the ultimate nirvija samadhi so it's very interesting so it doesn't happen in one go it also that if you go to the state of asampragyata for the first time again you will come back your mind won't go down to the state of ordinary human being but you will again go to the state of that bliss and stay there maybe for aeons together so that to go from that state this here that again that question a subtle question of choice comes whether i want to merge in the reality or i want to continue with the bliss there are many who want to continue with the bliss as chaitanya mahaprabhu used to say ami chini khete chai na ar ami chini hote chai na ami chini khete bhalobashi i don't want to become sugar i want to taste sugar very nice statement many want to be in that state of bliss if they go to that state they immediately want to come back they don't want to go there they want to enjoy the bliss it is not bad it's a question of choice the bhaktas they are they they, they really have the dread that state that ultimate reality they will never they will never hear of it but they go to that state even mahaprabhu he is had gone to that state but he never preferred he wants to come back even in the life of ramakrishna we will find very interesting thing we use the mantra to concentrate our mind the distraction mind we use the mantra for ramakrishna whenever he used to go to samadhi if you read the life when holy mother just see what a wonderful couple the holy mother stayed for few months with ramakrishna sharing the same bed her what was her duty her duty ramakrishna taught her if you see such and such signs of samadhi start repeating such and such mantra the mantra which we use to stop the distractions of the mind their ramakrishna is using to bring it down because he is having some purpose his birth is for some purpose that avatarana they come here to uh, that divulge the spiritual truth so that all can be saved so they are already established in that state if he merges in that the purpose won't be served so we will find a wonderful thing the same mantras holy mother is using to bring back that mind why it is going to that state of nirvija asampragatya state but that subconscious mind is filled with the bliss by repeating that mantra it is brought back again to that state of bliss it doesn't go uh, so that it doesn't continue in that state if it continues in that state what will happen just to uh, explain we will give another example our mind is something like an elastic a spring now spring has an elastic limit you know if you put some weight it will extend you remove the weight it will again go back to its original uh, shape but if you give a quiet uh, means huge weight which is beyond its elastic limit then the spring cannot go back it will just become plastic it will be extended forever so that happens if the virama pratyaya continues for too long the mind loses its capacity again to go back so then that's prati prasava these words will come much later the you know we evolved by following certain step the dissolution also starts in the same manner in the opposite manner to dissolve the mind to let you free to your real nature that's the state of kevala that's why the word kaivalya you used for that the ultimate nirvija sampragyata sam asampragyata samadhi what kaivalya is used why 
Kaivala is means Kevala. Now I am in association with the mind. When you go beyond the mind, then you alone exist in your own right. There is no duality, only you. Kevala means only. So that's the state of Kaivalya. So when you go to that state with the help of Virama Pratyaya, then what happens? Then that helps you. This, when this Virama Pratyaya becomes the cause of erasing even the Samskara Shesha. This Ridhambhara Pragya is the Samskara Shesha. The last Samskara that also is erased. And the Pragya Samskara, and that is being stated in the 18th Sutra. The 18th Sutra, that, we, that now, this is the Sutra. Means for explaining 17th and 18th, we resorted to this. Now it comes to the 18th Sutra. Virama Pratyaya Abhyasa Purva Samskara Shesha Anya. That even to get rid of that Ritambhara Pragya, that is the Samskara Shesha, that has killed all other Samskaras, that also is eaten up by this Virama Pratyaya. <coughs> we will stop our discussion today just with one example. Just with one example, I will end the discussion today. The example of Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya gives a wonderful example. That he says, you know, in the olden days, they used alum to cleanse the water. <coughs> they use alum to cleanse the water. And once the water is cleansed, the alum is also no more formed. It has dissolved. <coughs> Shankaracharya is saying that Ritambhara Pragya, <coughs> that ultimate samskara after cleansing the mind itself dissolves. <coughs> that has been explained in the 18th Sutra. We will, <coughs> it needs some explanation. We will again take up in the next class. With this, we stop our discussion today. Amiji, it was great fun to think of you as a naughty boy scaring that little girl. Excuse me? I said it was great fun to think of you as a naughty boy scaring that poor little girl. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every sage has a past, every sinner has a future. <laughs> <laughs> very nicely said. Thank you, Swamiji. Namaskar. Namaskar. And good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you so much. Namaskar. 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 Namask